Have you ever noticed that the news media, whether on television or in print, is full of stories of hatred and violence? We hear of one group that hates another because their racial makeup, sexual preference, or cultural background. And then there are groups that hate others because of their political views, religious beliefs, or social standing. Then, on occasion, we're given stories that speak of love, hope, compassion, mercy, tenderness, courage, sacrifice, humility, or bravery. Well, these two extremes both exist in this world, which leads one to ponder the value of love and hate. We all would, without any real thought, consider love to be of great value. Love warms our hearts, and it touches our souls. We're moved by the tender touch of a mother with her child, and inspired by the sacrificial love of one willing to lose his life for another. But what about hate? Well, for most of us, hate is seen as a negative that has no real or positive value, but... Is that the case for all circumstances? Are there times when we should hate? Well, our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, is going to take us to the sixth chapter of Proverbs, verses 16 through 19, to answer the question, Does God hate? Dr. McGee served as the pastor of the historic Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles from 1949 to 1970. And it was during this 21-year pastorate that he first gave this sermon. But before we get to today's sermon... Let's hear from some listeners of our foreign language broadcasts. The first one is from a listener in India who hears our Aria language program. The letter reads, I'm a regular listener of your program. I once indulged in many bad things for which people looked down upon me, and my family members were also not happy about my activities. I quarreled with them always. Because of these things, I had no peace of mind. One day I happened to listen to your program, which touched my heart to the core. This program made a great impact on my life. I experienced a great change in my life. I gave up all my bad habits and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. It showed me the light of Jesus and gave me peace of mind. Thank you very much for this program. And next we have a letter from a listener of our Spanish program. He writes, I've listened to you for 24 years. I came to know the Lord when I was 17 years of age and I was serving my military obligations. Every night I had to do guard duty and they brought me a shortwave radio so I wouldn't get bored. So every night I listened to the radio. But one night, all of a sudden, there was a message from God, and I began to pay attention. When they invited people to listen in again, I began to listen to the program every night, and that's how, by the grace of God, I had the privilege of coming to know Jesus. May God richly bless you. Now, here's a letter. This is from a couple in India who are able to hear us in the Tamil language. With the help of a friend, they wrote, My wife and I are uneducated and came to the knowledge of Christ in the year 1999. Since we are illiterate, we are unable to read the Bible and were unaware of many of the hidden treasures in the Bible till we happened to listen to your program early in the morning. This program leads us to know the truth. As the Bible says, the truth will set you free. We are being freed from the lust of the world. We are listening to your message every day and we take down notes and meditate upon them. We are grateful to the Lord who teaches us through your program. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And finally, let's hear from a young Berber man who listens to the broadcast in the North African language of Kabyle. He writes, I'm a young man, age 20, and I am a student. One night I happened to come across your program. While listening, I was able to clarify several misconceptions of mine concerning the Christian faith. There are some Christians in my village that I spoke to regarding the Christian faith, They have greatly encouraged me to continue my search for God's truth. I asked them about your program, and they spoke very highly of it. I want to change my life for the better. Well, will you pray for this young man as he searches the scriptures for the truth about the salvation found only in Jesus Christ? And will you also pray for those who are listening to the radio program by God's grace who hear through the Bible radio in their own language? 
As we heard from these listeners, many people are not looking for us on the radio, but they find us, as they say, by accident. And they need our prayers, as God uses this ministry to touch their lives. So we sure hope that you'll remember to pray for the effective work of the gospel as we take it to the world in over a hundred languages and dialects. And now let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless your word as it goes out today. May it touch the lives of all who hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject today is, Does God Hate? Does God Hate? This seems to be a comparatively easy question to answer because one of the definitions of God is God is love. Since that is true, then it would be impossible for him to hate, for he is love. Furthermore, what would he hate and who would he hate in his universe? Now, this type of reasoning is a bit of sophistry That is certainly not satisfactory at all, and it does not adequately take in the Scripture in this particular subject. The fact of the matter is it's using the old philosophical method, the deductive method of the syllogism. There is a major premise and a minor premise and a conclusion. The major premise here is God is love. The minor premise is love is the opposite of hate. Both are true. And the conclusion, therefore, is God does not hate. May I say to you that conclusion is faulty, it's fatuous, fallacious, and foolish. Because you can move that down to the human plane today, And it's impossible today for a human being to love someone or something without hating the object. You love your child. You certainly, by the same token, will hate the fever that's racking the body of that precious little one. And if a mad dog should come into your yard frothing at the mouth, you would not permit your child to go and pat the dog on the head, though you have no antipathy against dogs. You may even belong to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, but that mad dog you hate if it's going to bite your child. You'd have to if you love your child. Love always requires the opposite. And as long as you and I live in a world of contrast, of opposite, where there's right and where there's wrong, where there's sin and where there's righteousness, there will be both love and hate. And we are told in Scripture, love the good, hate the evil. And in the next book in the Old Testament that we shall be uh, taking, the book of Ecclesiastes, we are told there's a time to love and a time to hate. And you will find that God makes it very clear that he hates. You go back to the very beginning in the book of Deuteronomy in the 16th chapter. God was a long time getting around to telling anybody he loved them, by the way. You have to go to the book of Deuteronomy to find it. But at that same time, he also mentioned the fact that he hates also. In Deuteronomy 16, 22, neither shalt thou set thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. God says he loves. God also says that he hates. And you will find again, if you move into the 45th Psalm, that in itself moves into the millennial kingdom, you will find that it's said of the Messiah, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. When you come to the end of the Old Testament, God says a very strange thing. Esau have I hated, and Jacob have I loved. That's always been a puzzle to a great many folks. And a student years ago came to Dr. Griffith Thomas and said, I'm having a problem with that scripture. And I can't understand why God would say he hates Esau. 
And Dr. Griffith Thomas said, I'm having a problem with it too, but not the same one. I can't understand why God says that he loved Jacob. I can understand why he hated Esau. Very easy to see that, by the way. But God never said it at the beginning. He, you have to see Esau become Edom, a nation of 250,000 individuals where God can say, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, and you're lifted up. And because of that, God says, I will judge you and I'll bring you down. And then God says, I hate this sort of thing, and I hate those that are identified with it. You will find again at the end of the Old Testament in Zechariah, and let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor, and love no false oath, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. And someone says, but that's peculiar to the Old Testament. When you get to the New Testament, it's new and God no longer hates. Let's go to the end of the New Testament and listen to the resurrected Christ today as he speaks to his church in Revelation 2, 6, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So that the living Christ this morning at God's right hand, though he loved and loved to the very nth degree, can also be said that he hates. There is a flavor today that the Chinese and the European chefs have developed. It's known as the sweet sour flavor, and it's delicious. May I say to you, God has developed it all, so only it can be said God is love and God is hate. Because the very fact that he would love the right would immediately fill up the vacuum that he hates the evil. Therefore, you can truly say that God loves and God hates. Now in Proverbs 6, he goes on record. In fact, he puts down in a ledger the seven things that he hates. Listen to him. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. That, by the way, is Hebrew poetry. The book of Proverbs is poetry, and they attain poetry by parallelism, comparing one to another. He always uses the term, these six things God hates, then comes along and say, seven things God hates. Now, my way of thinking, you could just say seven and be done with it, but he didn't do that. He, went, he uses this as poetry, and this is the way it was attained. Therefore, there are seven things that God hates, and seven is definitely here not a number of perfection, but seven is a number of completeness in the Word of God. There are seven things now that God hates. This more or less runs the full scale of the things that he hates today. Now, will you notice that here is a list of the works of the flesh. It reveals here the total depravity and the utter degradation of the human heart. God has gone on record that he hates these things and he denies today the thesis of modernism and liberalism that somehow or another he is a sentimental and senile old woman who weeps but never works who shuts his eyes to the sins of mankind and that he's tolerant with evil and that he forgives because he hasn't the intestinal fortitude to punish sin and that he's charitable to the guilty because he doesn't have the courage to go through with a strong program of judgment, that he's afraid today of public opinion and he runs from any appearance of offending man because God is a coward. May I say to you, that's the picture that liberalism gives when it overemphasizes the fact God is love, and they slop over on every side when they say that. May I say to you, God is love, and we'll not lower the flag one whit from that. Standard, and it's a high standard. But my beloved, the Word of God also says that he will by no means clear the guilty. 
God never yet has cleared a guilty soul. Every sin has to be punished. That's the reason Christ died for you. Because that sin of yours has to be punished. His laws are inviolate and inexorable. Now, this morning, let's look at this hateful brood that are listed here, these seven things. And they belong on the hate side of God's ledger, if you please. Will you notice number one, a proud look. That's number one on God's hate list. You can translate that a little differently. Eyes of loftiness. It's that which overvalues self and undervalues the man next to you. It was Quarles years ago who made this statement concerning this, this particular item. As thou desirest the love of God and man, beware of pride. It is a tumor in the mind that breaks and poisons all thy actions. It is a worm in thy treasure which eats and ruins thy estate. It loves no man, is believed of no man. It disparages virtue in another by detraction. It's the friend of the flatterer, the mother of envy, and the devil of mankind. It hates superiors. It scorns inferiors. It owns no equals. In short, tell thou hatest. God hates thee. Strong statement, but very true even in this modern day in which we live. Pride was evidently the first overt act of sin in heaven, the original sin. We find back in Isaiah the 14th chapter, Lucifer, son of the morning, that creature created higher than any other creature, became filled with pride. And he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The devil never thought he'd be opposite from God. He wanted to be like God, take God's place. And it was pride that lifted him up, and he fell. Then he came into the Garden of Eden, and what was his insinuating suggestion to man? Ye shall be as God. You can run your own little show. You can bow God out of his universe, and you won't need him any longer. Pride, if you please. I talked to a man who is a psychologist. I'm not sure he's here today. And he gave me this, and it happens to be good theology also, that back of all psychological disturbances and psychosomatic disease is the trunk of the tree from which all abnormality springs. And whether it be paranoia, whether it be some neurosis or some complex, whatever it is, it all goes back to this trunk of the tree, a lack of being a complete personality, and that it it all goes back to this thing that's innate in the human heart, I want to be somebody. And that's the reason that men today have status symbols. The teenage boy gets him a hopped up jalopy. His dad gets a Cadillac. That's a status symbol. He means he's somebody. That makes him complete. Oh, today, how many of us? Uh, want to be somebody. And man carries that on to the place where many did it. Today, they had an independence day, but they declared their independence of God, and they didn't need him anymore. They said, I'll be my own God. I want my will, and I want my way. And that's pride. God says, he resists the proud. He hath respect unto the lowly. He said he'll bring down high look. And in the book of Job, look on everyone that's proud and bring him low. That was the prayer of Job. And it's very interesting to notice the contrast of these 
seven things God hates with the seven beatitudes our Lord gave. Our Lord said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here God says, I even hate a proud look, if you please. And will you listen to him and listen to his word? As the psalmist says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. And then again, you will find that he says, in Isaiah 66, 2, For all these things hath mine hand made, and all these things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. May I say to you, God says he hates a proud look, even of the look of pride, that which, was the thing that dumped on man the sin that has plunged him today in the lost condition that he's in. Then the second thing God says here that he hates is a lying tongue. There's more said about this tongue than anything else in Scripture. And the interesting thing is that this tongue is common to all races and all languages. A lying tongue can speak any language. And it's the real tongue's movement today, by the way. Here is one that I'm of the opinion that most people have talked in this tongue, the lying tongue, if you please. David found himself in the midst of that, and he cried out to God in Psalm 120, verse 2, Deliver my soul, O God, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? May I say to you, David again made the statement, I said in my haste, all men are liars. Oh, Dr. Carroll used to say, I've had a long time to think it over, and I still agree with David that he was right. All men are liars. May I say again that the Word of God is very clear in this connection. God said that he sent his people into captivity and that today they're in the condition they're in because of this very thing. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there's no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish. You look at the land of Palestine today, and why is it in the condition? It's because men are liars, if you please. God's very frank to say that's one of the reasons. And God himself is truth. Into thine hand I commit my spirit, thou hast redeemed me. O Lord God of truth. And Paul could say to a young preacher, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Paul says, the thing that I rest upon is this, that God cannot lie and I believe what he says. My beloved, when you and I did, today do not accept God's salvation, and we say that we're not saved because we've trusted him, we do make God a liar. God says, let every, let every man be, true, be false and be found a liar, but let God be true. So believe God today, for God cannot lie, but men do. And God says he desires truth in the inward part, and that he hates. Lying today, one of the most prevalent sins that there is. Then the third thing God says that he hates here, and hands that shed innocent blood. And certainly this that is repeated again and again in Scripture, in, Psalm, in Isaiah 59, 7, their feet run to evil, they make haste to shed innocent blood. 
and that's repeated in Romans 3, and a murderer is particularly odious and objectionable to both God and man today. The difference is just simply this, that God says the murderer should be punished, and today we're becoming lenient with murderers. God still says he hates those who shed innocent blood. Then the fourth thing that God says that he hates here, a heart that deviseth wicked imagination. And the word wicked imagination means thoughts of iniquity. My beloved, this just happens to take us all in. Our Lord said that out of the heart proceed these evil, awful things. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemy. I was speaking yesterday up at Forest Home at the Hollywood Christian Group, and I was telling them about an experience I had in Chicago of going to the cult uh, there, a little place in Chicago known as Baism, where you're supposed to think nice thoughts. And you go into a nice little cubby hole, and you sit down, and they're beautiful pictures, and they funnel in some very lovely music, and you listen, and may I say to you that you're supposed to sit there and think nice, beautiful, high, lofty thoughts. May I make a confession? I thought of the dirtiest things that were imaginable. And I just don't believe it. You can purposely go in and sit down and think nice thoughts. If you think you can, you try that and see what really comes to your mind. Our Lord said, out of the heart proceed these things. And my beloved, that's what's in the human heart today. Uh, it is the picture of man. Have you ever noticed that he's giving here the anatomy of evil and iniquity, eyes that are proud, tongues that lie, hands that shed, and now he says, a heart that deviseth wicked imagination. And the next thing will be the feet, if you please. And will you notice the next thing that he says here, feet that are quick to run to mischief. The heart uh, blazes the trail that the feet follow. And again, Isaiah 59 says, their feet run to evil. And that's the picture, again, if you please, of man as he is. That is the picture that God gives. And if you want to know what the flesh produces, God never changed that in the New Testament. Here is what comes out of the old nature that you and I have. In Galatians 5.19, now the practices of the flesh are clear. You don't argue about this. This is obvious. Look at the morning paper. I haven't seen it. But I guarantee you on the front page you'll find these things listed only by name and by act. Here they are. They are immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, division, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. He didn't even name them all. He got tired of looking at that evil lot, and he stopped. He says, there are others that I'm not even naming here, and these are the things our Lord says come out of the human heart. And man today is this kind of a man. You come to the end of the book of Revelation, and you see the new Jerusalem, and God says that in that city, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So that it's very clear from the word of God that God never changed his mind about hating these things at all. Now the sixth thing that he mentions here is a false witness that speaketh lies. And again, we are seeing that today. And very simply, he goes over that again and again in the book of Proverbs. In the 14th chapter, verse 5, a faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Perjury, if you please. And how many people today are willing to perjure themselves? The seventh and the last one that he mentions 
and he that soweth discord among brethren. I did not take time to do this, and I'm confident it can be done, that you can take these seven, put them down by the seven Beatitudes, and you'll find each one is a contrast. I did note this one was, he that soweth discord among brethren, and over against that the Lord said, blessed are the peacemakers, if you please. And that doesn't mean world peacemakers, the United Nations. It means a peace among brethren down here. Now, this is the lot that we've gone over. Seven uh, awful, terrible things that come out of the human heart. This is a hateful brood. Now, I'm sure that many of you, as you sat there this morning, you squirmed a little. And the reason that you did, because you see yourself in this mirror. And I'm sure that some, by way of self-defense, are saying, well, we're coming today to the Lord's table. And when you come to the Lord's table, you're not supposed to look at yourself. True. This table here sets forth his death. The bread speaks of his body that was broken, and that wine will speak of his blood that was shed. And we're to think on him. And somebody says, then why do you talk about these things? I'll tell you why. Because I have a question. Why did he die? Because I'm this kind of a person. And because you are that kind of a person. If God did not hate these pains, and if you and I were not this kind of a person, Christ would never have died. So when you and I come today to this table, we need to recognize that the reason he died was not because the religious rulers had him arrested and brought false charges against him, and it's not because the Romans crucified him on a Roman cross, but that the reason that he died, he died for you and he died for me. And the reason he died is because we are not fit for heaven as we are. He has to make us fit. He must forgive us our sin. He must make over to us his righteousness that we can stand complete in him. And then he says that if I have saved you down here from these things, you are to depart from them. Will you listen to Paul as he writes to the Ephesians? This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greedy greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now listen to him. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, wherefore putting away lying, speak the truth, every man with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Does your conversation during the week point men to God? If anybody stepped up and listened to you talk in your place of business, or in the classroom, or on the street, they be pointed to God, or would they be turned away from God? He says that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. 
What grieves the Holy Spirit of God? These are the things that grieve the Holy Spirit of God if a child of God engages in them today, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. My beloved, if today you are saved, it's because you've come to Jesus Christ and have trusted him. And if you are saved today, you are in Christ. And God sees you no longer in the old man with its deceitful lust, but he sees you now, the new man. He says, put on this as a garment and that these things that were formerly in your life be no longer in your life, but that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you live for God today. And that in this world today, you are not to go back and think on these things. I grant you what I've mentioned this morning is an hateful brood. Not nice to look at it, but it's your picture and my picture. The Lord Jesus said, out of the heart, not your neighbor's heart, a Stalin's heart, a Khrushchev's heart, but out of your heart, my heart, proceed these things. And if you're honest today, you know that's the truth. Therefore, he had to die on the cross because not only does God hate these things, God loves you. And the reason he hates these things because these things will destroy you and it would turn heaven into a hell if he turned you loose up there as you are. So he's made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now he says, as long as I let you walk in the world, walk as a child of the light down there. Don't think on these things, all right? Let's not think on them. This is our picture. Let's look at Christ when we come to the table. Here is his picture. Here is his story. Here is the briefest biography of Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and it means gracious, whatsoever things are of good report, that is of excellence, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise think on these things and you and I live in a world today that it has gone down down in its morals gone down down in its thinking so that today literature if it's to pass muster has to be dirty because we have no geniuses anymore only dirty literature gets by today and if you don't write it dirty, brother, it won't get by. Little women and little men and Pollyanna won't get by today. It must be dirty. And art today, well, look at it. It looks like the artist got angry, not only through his paint on the canvas, but through his brush there as well. That's art today. Why? Because our standards have gone down and down and you and I live in a confused world today. What can the child of God do in this world today? This table brings us to the place where we're to think on him. What about him? Well, he's the one who's true today. I'm the way, the truth, and the lie. Don't put your confidence in man, but put your confidence in him. He's true. He cannot lie. Paul says, I met him on the Damascus Road. And he's the first one I ever met that didn't lie to me. Whatsoever things are honest, then he's the honest one. Which of you convinceth me of sin? Whatsoever things are just, then he is the just and righteous judge, even today and will be. Whatsoever things are pure, and they've written a dirty biography of him today that's not true. There's no biographies, two of them, except Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the only record God permitted. That's the reason I believe that no biography of Christ should ever be written. 
You have to draw on your imagination, and when you read this, you read one who was pure. His very purity condemns you and me. His very presence condemned those that were round about him. Even Judith, who watched him with critical and jaundiced eyes for three years, had to say, I have betrayed innocent blood. He's pure, and he's lovely. Oh, how gracious he was. We need to think on him. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. And so today, as we come to the table, there are seven things that God hates, and because he hates them, you and I guilty of them, he went to the cross, but this table speaks of him, the one altogether lovely, the chiefest among 10,000. May we indeed think on him today. Shall we pray? As we come this morning to the Lord's table, I ask you merely to search your own heart today. I trust you'll be honest with yourself. And as you look at yourself, you know you're not worthy. Come to the table that speaks to him, but he didn't ask you to come because you're worthy. He asked you to come because he died for you and you trusted him. And he's invited you to come. This is his table. He says, all things are now ready. You can come. Go out in the highways, byways. Bring them in. You trust him. You can come. And when you come, don't look at yourself. You'll certainly be discouraged. Look to him. Look to him. He is the Savior today, and instead of trying to find your adequacy and your sufficiency, in trying to do something outside to impress people or try to measure up to a standard you can't measure up to, find your sufficiency in Christ and look to him. And may this table speak to you today of him. Our gracious, loving Father God, we do pray as we come now to this table, thou wilt indeed prepare our hearts and minds and enable us to look upon him, this wonderful, beautiful, precious, glorious Savior, for we pray in his name. Amen. Scripture makes it clear that we, as sinners, are unable to rise to the standards that God has established for holiness and salvation. But if you've come to an understanding that your works are inadequate and insufficient to save you, then you're ready to respond to God. He's calling you to receive his gift of salvation, which has already been paid for by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you'd like more information on what the Bible says about God's plan of salvation for your life, then we'd like to send you our salvation packet, which includes the leaflet, The Inside Story. In this leaflet, you'll find numerous scriptures that outline the plan of salvation for you. To receive your salvation packet, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime. And when you do call, be sure to include your name, address, and the call letters of this station. Does God Hate is the title of the sermon that we heard today. If you'd like to order an individual CD copy for yourself, a friend, or family member, you can do so by contacting one of our helpful service operators. And they can be reached by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Time. You can also use this number to order any of our resources from Dr. McGee's hardback and paperback volumes of edited messages to the complete five-year study on MP3 CDs. Now, before we close out our program, we'd like to take a moment to remind you to join us this week on the Through the Bible radio program heard on this station. We'll be continuing Dr. McGee's wonderful study in the book of Proverbs. Did you know that at your request, we can add you to our mailing list for our monthly newsletter? Our newsletter provides you with updated information about the progress of our ministry around the world. It also contains a brief excerpt of a message from Dr. McGee. If you'd like to receive this newsletter on a monthly basis, you can do so by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE. You can also use our internet order form at ttb.org or by writing to Sunday Sermon. For those in the U.S., Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C 6B1. Now this is Steve Schwetz with the prayer that God will fill you with His grace, mercy, and peace every moment of every day. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, crimson stain. he washed it by
This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.